Hey there, everyone. Have I got a treat for you today? Because guess what? I have opened this totally awesome time machine and I am now coming to you direct from the 80s, which the very oldest I would have been in the 80s is 10 years old. So wait, maybe it's a good thing it's not really the 1980s because my hair looks stupid like this. Uh, it's really too thin to put up like at all and no amount of Aquanet is gonna save it. Anyway, on to the fun stuff. I decided to go back and reread Christopher Pike. You remember Christopher Pike? You hear so much nowadays still about R.L. Stein because Goosebumps is still pretty popular, right? Although honestly, I don't remember Goosebumps from when I was younger. I remember Fear Street. I don't remember Goosebumps. But then again, I miss things. That's kind of a thing. <laughs> so anyway, Christopher Pike, I was into at least somewhat. I had a few of his books. And I thought, you know, what the hey, let's go back and read them. And were they really as good as I'm remembering? Or are they dated and not? Yeah. Well, let's find out. First, a bit about the author. Christopher Pike is a pseudonym, and there's not a ton out there about the author himself. He didn't give a lot of interviews. He wasn't a real public type of guy. There are a few interviews floating around out there. He used to live in uh, California, um, still does, as far as I know. I, I, I don't know. I didn't look up his address. I'm not hiding in his bushes. So anyway, Christopher Pike was a very popular horror writer for teens um, in the late 80s and uh, early to mid 90s. He still writes. I did not know that. <laughs> um, and he's still decently popular, uh, although not as popular as he was, I, I think because a lot of his target audience aged out. But yes, he does still definitely have his fans. One thing about Pike books um, that I remember from going to the bookstore or even the library um, is the covers. The covers were very striking. Uh, let's look at some of them. Those are the American covers. Uh, now I looked it up and those were done by illustrator Brian Kotsky. He did a few Hardy Boys covers. Um, other than that, there is not a lot out there about him. The covers in the UK was Paul Davies. I did not know there were different cover artists, but eh, that, that's a common thing. The books have been reissued, which is actually what kind of sparked the whole idea in the first place. I saw one of them at the library. Couldn't interest my teens in it, but you know. And it had been reissued, and the book was Remember Me, right? One of his big ones. And it had been reissued with different but the same cover art. Like, it's the same picture, but it's not, it's not at all. It's been what I call canva right? After the website, it, it, uh, I like Canva. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I use it myself. Um, it's very good, serves a purpose, but the thing about Canva is that it's cheap and it's quick and that's what these covers look like. It's, it's, it's not good. Okay, so the books and my thoughts. I combed eBay and I tracked down, I went with eight books. I don't, I didn't read them all because as it turns out, he has written roughly 80 books. I had no idea. Man's been busy. Good for him. Um, but yeah, that, that was, that was a little much. So I just went with eight books, um, a couple which I remember reading, and the rest which I remembered seeing on the shelves and never got around to. The first book, well, um, I got this, as I said, I got them all on eBay, and this was a gift set of four books. It had two of the books I really wanted, so I just went with the other ones. Um, this cover right here is Scavenger Hunt, so let's start with that one. Scavenger Hunt, mm-hmm. Published 1989. Scavenger Hunt is interesting because it is the only book I read of his that has a male protagonist. He went with female protagonists very often. Scavenger Hunt is one of his more supernatural novels. There's a lot of supernatural elements. 
Most of his books focus on teenagers, high schoolers, living typical high school lives, except not at all. Because basically, underneath it all, these books are like noir pulp fiction, um, sometimes with supernatural elements. And even in the ones that don't have supernatural elements, sometimes the things that happen are just so completely off the wall, cuckoo banana pants. Um, this book, yeah, a lot of cuckoo banana pants stuff, but you know, with supernatural elements in it, you can, you can kind of, that's an excuse <laughs> right there. What we have in this one is the scavenger hunt of the title. Carl is the main character. He is on a team with Ceci, the girl he has the hots for, Ceci's brother, Davey, um, and his old friend, Tom. Now, Carl also had another friend. This friend, Joe, uh, died in an accident and Carl uh, feels guilt for his death. Now, on the other scavenger hunt team, well, there's a lot of scavenger hunt teams, but uh, the one they're kind of neck and neck with is uh, Tracy, who has a thing for Carl, and Carl knows it, but he's all taken up by, by Ceci. Um, then there's Tracy's friend, Paula, who is also Joe's ex-girlfriend, and Paula's brother, Rick. I, th I think that's everybody. There are always a lot of characters in here, so it's hard to keep track of them all. So... Did I mention there are going to be spoilers? There are going to be spoilers. I'm mentioning it now. <laughs> okay, so um, it turns out Davy and Ceci are not really people. They are uh, like lizards from the past, but also the future. Did I get that right? Um, who can time travel and they are masquerading as people and they do this every hundred years and feed and kill so that they can keep doing it or something. And um, then Tom is also actually Joe. But Ceci and Davey have mind control powers, so they have reanimated him and manipulated everyone's memories so that they don't recognize him. Now, there are a bunch of tropes in these novels, which I'm going to kind of... Um, bring it all together at the end. So, like, there's the bad girl, there's the good boy, there's the people with issues. Well, they all have issues. Um, one that showed up a couple of times is the disabled person, and that person um, is always noble and uh, ready to sacrifice themselves. In this particular one, it's Paula's brother, Rick, and sacrifice himself. He does. Uh, one of those tropes, I'm not, and I'm not exactly sure if that... H. Claw. Um, moving on. For my next book, I'm going to go with Spellbound. Mm, it's a bit of a glare. Spellbound. <laughs> Spellbound was written beforehand in 1988. This one also has supernatural elements to it. Now, Spellbound covers a uh, young lady who, uh, she's the, the heroine here, and um, her boyfriend was accused of killing his former girlfriend, even though it, it looked like she was chopped up by a grizzly, but he was alone with her and everyone thought maybe it was him. So I guess maybe it was him or the bear. And this book brings up another common pike trope. There is the friend who's kind of a mysterious girl. And then it turns out at the end that she uh, is the villain. And in, in this particular case, she is a shapeshifter. They often, very often, have dark hair and gray eyes. That's a very common thing. Now, in this case, Jane has dark hair and her eyes are just described as dark, but close enough. Cindy is our heroine here. The heroines always have one or two friends who they can confide in. Um, Pam is described rather judgmentally by Cindy as having, quote, a big nose and a chunky backside, but she makes up for it by being easy. <laughs> I've noticed, um, when it comes to descriptions, uh, big noses, those with big noses don't tend to be sympathetic characters. Cindy also has a little brother, Alex. The younger brothers are always nice guys. At least in, in all the eight books I read here, they're always nice guys. Cindy's boyfriend, Jason, did not kill his girlfriend, but he turns out to be a giant jerk. Um, this is 
kind of half and half with the boyfriends. Sometimes they really are actually good guys. Sometimes they turn out to be just real jerks or a-holes or sometimes the villains. So anyway, when Cindy realizes that she drops him like a hot rock. Now, she has already had the hots for the secondary male lead. Um, this male lead is black. And I mention him specifically because that is not a common thing in these books. Uh, late 80s, 90s, not a good time. Um, I mean, it's not just the cover art. That wasn't a good time uh, in the media for leads, especially in groups, especially in groups of people for the leads to be people of color. So even just including one was seen as a pretty big deal. And this is interesting because, uh, like I said, there are not a lot of people of color in his books generally. Now, he did address this. There is an interview out there um, or two where he pointed this out himself. And he said, you know, I could have pushed for this more because... I was, a, I got to be a pretty big author and I could have, and I don't know why I didn't, if I was lazy or what, but I didn't and I regret that now. So I'm very glad to see him confronting the issue. Okay, so the secondary male lead, Bala, I believe that's how it should be pronounced. He is African, um, an exchange student, and his... Um, or grandfather, no, his grandfather, uh, was a medicine man in their tribe. Um, and Bala knows all about the magic and has experienced himself. So one might say that he is the tropey, magical black dude. Uh, did you hear that? Oh my God, it's, in, it's, in, it's snoring, but it sounds like even my dog is going, Ugh. That said, Bala is a pretty cool character. Yeah, he's strong, he's brave, it, there's a lot of good qualities about him. Also, this was a book that got me wondering because a lot of the experience takes place up on a mountain and a cliff. Um, sounds like Pike spends a lot of time outside. And um, I was wondering if he has a thing about drowning because that seems to figure in a lot and this book is no exception. There's a lot of fear of falling into the river. The characters do actually fall into the river a couple of times, and um, they barely make it out again. And this is far from the only book where that happens. Also, the thing that really bugged me about Spellbound, and I know other people have commented on this too, there are a series of articles written um, about the incident with Jason and his former girlfriend. And the reporter is uh, doing all this salacious sort of um, supposition of what might have happened. And that's not reporting. <laughs> that's not reporting at all. That's not journalism. That's, uh, I don't know what that is. That's like tabloids. But this is supposed to be in the actual paper. Plus, which the article goes on and on. It is a very long article and it's just not written like journalism. I think I'm going to go through the books with more supernatural elements since that's where I started and um, just kind of segue into the more straight up murder mystery ones. Which means the next book is Witch. Witch was copyrighted 1990, later than the other two. Which is definitely a more supernatural one and like you can tell by the title. Um, Julia is the one of the main characters. You can't really call her a protagonist. She's an anti-heroine? I don't know if that's even really... She kind of shares the protagonist role. Amy is the other protagonist. She is Julia's best friend. And no magical powers whatsoever, except for a bit of a connection she shares with Julia. Um, however, Julia does some definite not good things. Um... So it's really hard to argue she's the hero. Another trope. There are not many adults in his books. And he also talked about that because um, it, he wrote books with teens as the center. And so adults just didn't seem to figure in as much. And it makes sense that when you're a teenager, adults are not necessarily part of your world more than you want them to be. When there is an older woman, often she is kind of plain, kind of tired looking, and she tends to do, 
it's not lawful good i don't remember what it's called uh, she tends to do what she believes to be the right thing that would be Julia's aunt, who is kind of the leader of the coven, um, especially since Julia's mother has passed away. Oh, another trope uh, that is in this book is a side character with a drug problem. Uh, that would be one of the villains in here, and it's used to add to his um, villainy, scariness. Another very dated trope here <laughs> is the lovable goofball guy who makes sex jokes all the time and they're supposed to be funny when they really, really are not. This book is one of the worst for that that I read. You've got a character who... Hmm, very weird things in this book. Get to that in a second. Um, you've got a male character who, among many other things, he masquerades as an OBGYN doctor and gets into the maternity ward. And he's like, oh, it's okay if I'm scoping, you know, certain parts, you know, as long as they're not actually giving birth. This guy's supposed to be an endearing, lovable goofball who we root for? It, let's just say it didn't age well. I won't dwell too much on the plot because I can't. Too much happens. Um, there's the football player who first Amy falls for and then Julia falls for, and that tends to be the way it goes, but Amy loves Julia so much that she forgives her. She's like, I know it's just this magneticism you have that makes the guys go for you. I'm going to forgive you. Anyway, Julia has a vision about the football player, Jason, and she tries to prevent his death and eventually can't. And coinciding with that, like her anger and desire for revenge and the fact that she couldn't prevent his death leads her down a dark path. And the plot just seems to go completely off the rails from there. There's like a shootout inside the liquor store that goes on for forever. It gets really violent and you're like, what, what even is going on? It, it was really weird. Next up, Bury Me Deep. Copyright 1991. The heroine here is Jean, described as a California girl with classic good looks. Not much description other than that. Jean is going on a trip to Hawaii. She is meeting her friends Mandy and Michelle out there. Um, well, Mandy is her friend. Michelle is more an acquaintance. Anyway, they've all pitched in together on this trip. On the plane trip, Jean meets Mike, who uh, is like the innocent, he, he's kind of like the younger brother character. He's a really nice guy. Um, they get to talking. Um, he's going out to Hawaii for the first time and really excited. And then inexplicably, he dies just out of nowhere. So Jean is still kind of in shock when she arrives. Her friends tell her to, you know, just try and enjoy the trip and, you know, get it off her mind. So Jean th tries to throw herself into things. She, uh, they take scuba diving lessons at their hotel, and Jean ends up with a thing for the diving instructor, Johnny. Johnny is the classic California-looking guy, too. He's blonde-haired, blue-eyed, um, kind of laid-back, whatever, bro. Um, his friend Dave, also a scuba instructor, has dark hair and gray eyes. Very serious guy. Dave is not the villain. So he kind of had a little uh, MacGuffin thing going on there. It turns out the villain was Johnny. Mm, my surprise. Although not, also not because, like I say, half the time the boyfriend is the villain. Anyway, because the guys, uh, their side venture is, or maybe their main venture, boat trips for people who want to scuba dive, and they have the girls come with them a couple of times, which sets the stage for these weird dreams that Jean keeps having about Mike and this one spot in the ocean that she discovers, which has a skeleton in it, which then disappears. And anyway, there is a lot about scuba diving in this book. I realized that Pike must really like scuba diving and he did in fact confirm that in an interview he has been scuba diving off the coast of maui and that inspired a lot of stuff in this book oh and also that means that this is another one with the possibility of drowning which also if he's been scuba diving it might make sense why it would come to mind as a fear something to be confronted. There's another book with supernatural elements, but I'm gonna save that for the last and skip straight to Fall Into Darkness, copyright, 
copyright 1990 i had to look <laughs> Okay, Fallen to Darkness is a non-supernatural book. It focuses on Anne's plan for revenge on her former best friend, Sharon. It starts with Sharon beginning her trial for the murder of Anne. Everybody thinks Anne is dead. The thing about the trial, the whole courtroom experience, it reads like the quote-unquote journalism segments of Spellbound. It's just not believable. I mean, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I have never been in a courtroom, um, but I have watched a lot of movies with courtroom scenes. Okay, and I've read Perry Mason, so I'm practically an expert here. And it's like Perry Mason, and perhaps worse than Perry Mason, in, in that I just don't believe that a lawyer would be allowed to say those things and get away with it. Uh, by a judge. And this is another way that older women don't really come across well in the books. There's the prosecuting attorney who is an older woman described as very plain, uh, doesn't wear a speck of makeup, how dare she? She is also very brusque and not a very good attorney. Sharon's attorney is a younger man who is attractive and knows it and uses that to his advantage. He is more of a slimy lawyer and comes across that way. However, what he does works. Again, it's hard to say if we're supposed to root for him or not. Even Sharon doesn't really like him, but she'll take him. Okay, so back to Anne. Anne's brother, Jerry. Younger brother, Jerry, is uh, a nice guy. He dies before the story takes place. Um, supposedly, supposedly it was by his own hand. Um, however, Anne blames Sharon for it because she knew that Jerry had a thing for Sharon and she thought that Sharon, uh, pushed him away on purpose and that's what led to him being despondent. So, their group of friends goes into the mountains and Anne uh, and Sharon go off together. They hear Anne scream, don't, and then they come back to find that Sharon is alone and she says that Anne jumped. Now, we see pretty quickly that this was Anne's plan all along. It was her idea. Um, she pulled in her boyfriend, Paul, to help her out with it. Um, interestingly, Anne's like 17, 18, and her boyfriend is 20-something. I mean, he's not that much older, but still. I, this is a thing that happens a couple times, and it's like, really, these are high schoolers. That's not, that's not, they're not of age yet. Anyway, then there's Paul's brother, Chad, who is definitely of age. Paul has dark hair, dark eyes, um, kind of a put-off disposition, and a large nose. <laughs> so does Chad, although Chad is a sweet boy. He is the friend, the friend-zoned guy, although Sharon thinks she might date him by the end. However, uh, perhaps because now she's thinking of him as boyfriend material, it turns out that he was the killer all along. Um, and yes, there was a killer and did not initially die. It was her plan to fake her death and then run off and leave Sharon in jail for her murder. However, they do later find her body, um, not where they expected it to be, but like down river, like it got washed away. Um, but it does turn out that she went over the cliff on a line and then there was an accident. She managed to disengage herself and start heading away. Then Chad found her and chased her down and then uh, did away with her. Oh, did I mention that Anne has dark hair and gray eyes? She's not exactly the villain, um, but she is kind of a mysterious, unusual girl. Not like other girls. Not a lot of Pike books have been adapted. There have been many like, oh, big news, this is going to happen. There are many works in the works, uh, but then it doesn't happen. There have been two instances that I know of. Fall into Darkness was made into a TV movie in 1996 with Tatiana Ali. I believe her boyfriend at the time, Jonathan Brandis, I believe he was in it as well because I remember watching it at the time. I was kind of into Jonathan Brandis at the time. And it was not very good. It wasn't uh, real faithful to the source material, and Pike was not too happy with it either. There are rumors that he didn't want his stuff made into movies or whatever, and he says that wasn't true, um, but he was not happy about how 
fall into darkness went through. So he started saying no to a couple of things and that led to the idea floating around that he wasn't cool with it. The other adaption was pretty recent and I had no idea because it wasn't a title I was familiar with. Uh, it's The Midnight Club on Netflix. They only wound up doing one season. The makers of it were hoping for more, I guess. But that one apparently followed a group of teenagers in um, hospice uh, nearing the end of their lives and telling these dark tales in order to try and cope with it. And every episode was a long, uh, and every episode was a different Pike story uh, already existing, like which apparently was one. So I thought that was really interesting. I seriously had no idea. <laughs> Okay, next up, Gimme a Kiss, 1988. This one has 152 pages, <laughs> it's not very much. This is another book, similar to Fall into Darkness, where uh, the main girl fakes her own death. And we open in the police station, they're questioning her friends, uh, trying to piece together what happened. Well, again, we find out pretty quickly that Jane faked her death and she did it in order to get revenge on a rumor that was being spread about her at school. Jane is the heroine and has brown hair and blue eyes. Her friend Alice, who uh, relays a lot of the evidence at the police station, has dark hair and gray eyes. And is kind of a mysterious, different girl. So what we have here is we have the heroine. We have the best friend who maybe we can't trust. We have the secondary friend who doesn't quite fit the mold. There are a lot of those. We have a clean-cut boyfriend, or is he? We have a rival for his affections for Jane, and she is the girl who's been around. These are a lot of commonly recurring character traits. Another common thing that happens, and it happens in this book, is that the villain uh, has a plan to fool everyone. And that plan piggybacks, especially in this case, piggybacks on the plan of the heroine. Now, in that process, the plans get really overcomplicated, but they do tie up any loose ends. Um, however, it becomes a little obvious that that's what the author is trying to do with that. It becomes a little obvious that that's what the author is utilizing it for. There are a few of these that have uh, the older detectives who are sympathetic to the characters, or at least the characters that they should be sympathetic to. Um, this one in particular is perhaps not quite appropriate and wouldn't be written nowadays because the sympathetic older detective spends a decent amount of his time ruminating on these teenage girls' looks and evaluating their attractiveness. Like, dude, they're teenage girls, dude. Ugh. Next to last, I saved the, my two favorites for the last because these are the ones I really remember. I want to say I also had Fall Into Darkness and Give Me a Kiss, but one of the main ones I remember is Last Act. Last Act was an early one written in 1988. For a Pike heroine, Melanie is unusual in that she has auburn hair and hazel eyes. That doesn't come up a lot. Um, maybe because this is one of his earlier ones, and he specifically says that he told his publisher he wanted the heroine to be more of a, quote, normal, unquote, girl, and not some gorgeous supermodel. In fact, a lot of his looks tropes don't necessarily apply in this one. Uh, this is a straight-up murder mystery. There's nothing supernatural here. This is about a high school play that goes wrong. It is a murder mystery that becomes a real-life murder mystery. Although I will say there is one looks trope that kind of... Rindy is the kind of mysterious girl um, who nobody really understands. She has dark hair, but she also has green eyes. Now, green eyes are usually a tip-off that this isn't the villain. Now, besides Melanie, there is Susan, who she befriends at her new school and is the one who directs the play and asks her to be in it. Susan has blonde hair and blue eyes. She is not necessarily beautiful, but she has a good disposition and a large chest, which makes her popular. This is another trope that becomes common in the books. 
see Melanie from Bury Me Deep, same type of character. However, in this one, it turns out that Susan is bonkers and actually wrote the play on purpose in order to kill Rindy and implicate Melanie. Okay, it's kind of overcomplicated. Oh, also this has a handicapped character, Clyde, who uh, was mostly paralyzed in an accident. He is stuck in a wheelchair. He comes in at the end and um, puts himself in the line of fire. He is noble and sacrificing. We get to read some excerpts of the play, and I would have actually liked to have seen this play performed because it reads kind of awkwardly, especially being a playwright. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that interesting. Okay, final book. Can you guess what it is? You probably can. <laughs> I already mentioned it. It is Remember Me from 1988. This for me and a lot of other people was the big one. This is still a very good book. Um, I, should, I probably should have mentioned that in the first place. Uh, for all the parts that are dated, all the tropes that don't work, all the shortcomings, these are still very readable. They're fun. They're not meant to be deep books, you know? They're, they're just these can be beach reads, these can be uh, mall reads, dare I say. Uh, you can polish them off in an afternoon or a late night under the covers. These are fun books, a bit over dramatic, but they are enjoyable. Now, remember me, these are white bread, California yuppie-ish kids. Sherry is our main character, and she is blonde with green eyes. There are those green eyes again. That means she's our heroine. She is a good person, a uh, bit self-centered and perhaps a bit shallow. Um, and she even points that up about herself uh, looking back in retrospect. So she is somewhat self-aware. Now, of course, this is the book where Sherry is a ghost. It is told in the first person, which is rare for Christopher Pike. And she is looking back on what happened to her and working on solving her murder. Now, and remember me, there is a cop who um, has a drinking problem and that's not like he actually drives while he's drinking, not a good thing, and does his job while he's drinking, not a good thing. Um, purportedly, he is a um, functioning alcoholic, um, but he's actually actively drinking with that. And his daughter also has her own issues and is a drug addict, so there's the minor character with a drug addiction, there's that trope. Now the friend with dark hair, great eyes, a personality laden with mystery because she's not like other girls. Guess who the villain turns out to be? You'll never believe it in a million years. Anyway, there are several other characters. There is Sherry, like I said. Sherry has a brother who is a sweet guy. She has a boyfriend who's kind of a jerk. There is her friend who's a bit kooky, but kind of nondescript in looks-wise. There is the popular girl who is also kind of nondescript, but has a large chest. And a lot, we're checking a lot of boxes with this one. And then there's Peter, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. He is another ghost who helps Sherry solve her mystery and basically becomes the boyfriend. Um, he is also a good guy, although he can be inappropriate at times. Like, he does finally confess that he watch Cherry in the shower <sighs> once or twice. And this being 1988, uh, she is rather flattered because that's how girls were supposed to react at the time. It, it, yeah, okay, so that, that part's a bit dated again. Okay, now all that said, I have dwelt a lot on the datedness. Um, but as I said, these stories are pretty well written. So if you look past the dated tropes, um, they can still be very enjoyable um, when you take them for the pulpy sort of thing that they are. His descriptions are very well done. They engross you in the story. What's interesting is Pikes's, Pikes's? fixation on the American West. All of these books are set somewhere in the American West. Remember Me, Scavenger Hunt, and Give Me a Kiss are all set in California. In Bury Me Deep, Jean is from California and goes to Hawaii, which 
technically is still in the American West. Nearly all of these are set in small towns, California or no. Fall into Darkness is set in Utah. Last Act is set in Iowa. Witch is set in Idaho. And Spellbound is set in Wyoming. Most of them are, as I said, small towns with uh, mountains, uh, rivers, possibly a desert, big areas where the characters can go out and explore and confront danger in nature. Now, when it comes to tropes, there is one particular one that definitely did not age well, and I do want to mention that as well. And that is the depiction of overweight characters. I don't know what it is, but any character who is described as being overweight is done so in a very uncomplimentary manner. Sometimes it is a more subtle thing, like in Bury Me Deep, um, the character of Mandy, the friend who has a sweet personality but tries too hard, she's not especially attractive, and she is big boned is how it's put. In Last Act, there is a character who is described as pudgy, and in Spellbound, there is a girl who has a big backside. Fall into Darkness, Witch, and Give Me a Kiss all have characters who are overweight, um, side characters, and they are definitely not complimentary descriptions. It, it gets to the point where I'm going, for crying out loud, Christopher Pike, were you scared by an obese person when you were a kid? Did they jump out and go boogie, boogie, boogie? I mean, what is going on here? So that especially got to be a bit much. Those are all the tropes that did not age well, you have been forewarned. So do I recommend rereading these books? Well, that is up to you. If you take these uh, tropes that did not age well into account, um, and you still want to go ahead and read the books. I mean, you know that they're there. Um, and if you're okay with, with that, then, well, I really hope you're not. Um, but again, I can't speak for other people. Um, I just really hope you're not. Um, at least you know that they're there. As I said in my last video, um, with Caleb West, a book that did not completely age well due to vastly outdated tropes um, is kind of the Looney Tunes disclaimer that these things were wrong then and they're wrong now and really it's only now that we're starting to confront them and I'm glad that we are so hopefully we can do better but in the meantime to say that this isn't something that happened would be doing things an injustice we have to acknowledge these things happened so that we can move on now, all that said, there were so many recurring tropes in these things that I couldn't resist having a little fun. Uh, let's go ahead and see, just on these eight books, how many times these tropes occurred. Okay, everybody, I would like to introduce you to the Christopher Pike trope board. It's all in good fun. I think I might make one of these for my own work and see what my commonalities are. Starting from the top, all the books that I read for this video, remember me. Last Act, Fall Into Darkness, Spellbound, Witch, Bury Me Deep, Scavenger Hunt, and Gimme a Kiss. Tropes include Set in the American West, A Short Character, A Female Lead, A POC Character, Green Eyes, Large Noses, Overweight Character, Brown Hair, Brown Eyes, Unredeeming Features, The Sweet Younger Brother, The Nice Boy is the Real Villain, Dark Hair, Dark or slash gray eyes. The older woman who is plain, tired, does what they think is right. Handicap character? Did I say that one? Large chest, popular girl. Drug use by minor character. Unrealistic exposition and supernatural elements. The sympathetic cop and the endearingly <laughs> inappropriate male. Okay, let's get started. Short character. That would be, remember me, Sherry, the heroine, and Fall Into Darkness. POC character. That would be Remember Me. And also in da -da -da, Spellbound, Green Eyes. Remember Me, the heroine Sherry. Fall Into Darkness. 
That would be the villain. Last act, that is actually a side girl character. That is to say, Rindy, who was also the victim and the mysterious girl. And which? Which would be Julia, who, as I said, is kind of the heroine, kind of the villain at the same time. Dark hair and gray eyes. Okay, that's going to be quite a few. We've got Remember Me. We've got Who is the Friend slash Villain. We have Fall into Darkness. Again, the Friend slash Villain. We have Last Act. That would be the Boyfriend. We have Very Deep, the secondary male lead character. We have Scavenger Hunt on a technicality because the villain has dark hair and dark blue eyes. We have Spellbound also on a technicality because they have dark hair and dark eyes. Never specified. And Gimme a Kiss, who is the friend slash eventual villain. The sweet younger brother. Well, we've got one of those in Remember Me. We have one in Fall into Darkness. We have one in Last Act. We have one in Scavenger Hunt. There it is. And we have one in Spellbound. Okay, the older woman, plain tired, does what they think is right. We have one of those in Witch. And also in Remember Me. Because that was... Sherry's friend Amanda's mother, and it turns out that she and Amanda were switched at birth, and Amanda's mother knew it the whole time, and this is the secret she's been carrying around, and she switched them at birth, uh, and she kind of regrets it, but kind of thought it was the right thing to do, and it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very soap opera -y plot, that one. The large-chested popular girl. There's one in Remember Me. There is one in Last Act. There is one in Bury Me Deep. There's one in Spellbound if we're going to take a technicality. It doesn't mention she has a large chest, but that she is easy. And same thing with Gimme a Kiss. We're going to take a technicality because she is described as curvaceous. The quote-unquote, endearingly, inappropriate male. Okay, there's one in Remember Me. All the way over there. There is one in Spellbound. And there are two, count them, two, in which supernatural elements. Well, you can probably guess that Remember Me has those. Also Witch. Also Scavenger Hunt. Also Spellbound. And you know what? I wasn't going to, but we might say Bury Me Deep. Um, again, on a technicality, because Jean has dreams about what happened, so. Drug use by a minor character. You guessed it. Remember me. Has that too. I lost my thread. And also, which? Where am I? There we are. The overweight character. We have one in Fall into Darkness. And last act, we have a character described as pudgy. There's one in which, and it's... <laughs> It's especially an egregious description in there. Oh, it's bad. As mentioned, Bury Me Deep has Mandy, described as Big Boned. We can take that as well. Spellbound, girl with big backside. Like, that's a bad thing or something. And all the way over, Give Me a Kiss has one as well. Set in the American West. This one's going to be busy. Remember me. Last act. Fall into darkness. Spellbound. <laughs> Witch, ah, bury me deep, scavenger hunt, and let's get all the way over here. Give me a kiss. The sympathetic cop. Remember me, last act, and give me a kiss. The nice boy is the real villain. That occurs in Fall into Darkness, and bury me deep. Brown hair, brown eyes, unredeeming features. This is the best friend of Beth in Remember Me. This is the nice boy turned villain of Chad in, to fa in Fall into Darkness. The older woman of Sally and Witch. And the friend Mandy in Bury Me Deep. Unrealistic exposition. This occurs in... Do -do -do -do. Fall into Darkness. Fall into Darkness would be the courtroom scene, as mentioned. And Spellbound 
with the quote-unquote news reports. Large noses. I took that in at the corner here. Fall into darkness. I really should have braced this thing better. And also bury me deep. The handicapped character. That would be a last act with the ex-boyfriend. And also in scavenger hunt with the sweet and kind noble younger brother. And last but not least, the female lead. Well, that covers Remember Me. That covers Last Act. That covers Fall into Darkness. That covers Spellbound. That covers Witch. That covers Bury Me Deep. And that covers Give Me a Kiss. <laughs> there we have it. And this proves nothing. It really proves nothing. It means really nothing at all whatsoever, but it's interesting nonetheless. And there are patterns. There's a pattern here. Perhaps this does mean something after all. <laughs> so I have proved something here today. I don't know what it was. Uh, but I sure had fun doing it. And I did have fun uh, rereading these books, revisiting the time, as it were, warts and all. If you go ahead and reread these books, or you have reread these books, or you never stopped reading these books, let me know. And do check out more about Christopher Pike. Like I say, the man is still writing, and it sounds like he's taking these sort of concerns into, into consideration, which is always good to hear. So if you want to know more, there is a blog that I got a lot of info about. There is a podcast. Um, I'm going to put links to all this stuff down below. He has a Facebook page, which I don't think he posts on regularly, but there are a couple of admins and they update every now and again. So there is information to be had out there and it's quite interesting. So let me know your thoughts on Pike, his books, on the aging of tropes and those tropes that every writer has. It's definitely not just Pike. We all have character tropes, plot tropes, things that we repeat. And are they going to age well? Well, hopefully. Hopefully we're being mindful of it. Um, but who can say for the future? Um, for right now, I am just going to look ahead to the future of next week. And I hope to see you there, with or without my fabulous time travel machine, and definitely without this weird piggy tail thing. I tried. I, I, I tried. <laughs> it didn't work, but I tried. I'll see you later. Bye.